Henry. Thank you. So I much. thank you for the invitation to contribute to your committee. Thanks. Thank you, Henry. So oh, next, no. next speaker, uh, we have our chair, uh, Imad Kanan, and uh, uh, he's going to talk us about the, the retromastoid approach and variants to the cerebellopontine ankle tumors. Okay, do you see my slides? Yes, we do. All right. Yes. Wonderful. Well, I'd like to thank the attendees that they have been patient to wait until that presentation, but giving something like what Henry giving is fantastic. And I'm sure it's a lot of education material by all the faculties. I'm going to talk a uh, simple talk on retromastoid approach and variants to CP angle. I'm not going to do much on the pre-sigmoid approach combined HACOR approach because my colleague, uh, Dr. Sanjeeva, he'd like to give the anterior petrosa and posterior petrosa. So a piece of chronicle history, we have to mention something that uh, Koch and uh, Hellenberger were the first to coin the CP angle as a, a region. Thomas Allendahl did the first successful surgery, but I'd like to jump on Cushing, one of the, oh my God. One of the masters of neurosurgeon, uh, he called that area the, the bloody angle because the outcome of his procedure was very poor at the time, no microscopy. Dandy modified his suboccipital into unilateral approach and make it more lateral to become uh, the first retromastoid approach in 1934. And of course, Conce and Van, they were the first who performed the microsurgical total resection uh, using the microscope very early in 1957. Of course, William House, he uh, developed the translabyrinthian and I leave these things from, for the DNT, I'm not acquainted with these approaches. The most common pathology we see in the CP angle is the vestibular schwannoma followed by meningioma and epidema. Just a piece of information, all these CP angle tumors represent only one to 2% of total intracranial tumors. But you see how much, uh, uh, because of the challenge, it became very attractive for all of us and to focus on this area. These are the different approaches, the retrosigmoid, uh, pre-sigmoid, retro lab, and the pre-sigmoid, uh, retro lab combined. I left the two translabyrinthine and transcochlear out <clears throat> because these are for us as a neurosurgeon, they are not uh, hearing saving procedure and usually we don't like to do them and we, we join our ENT colleague to perform such procedure. How you select the approach based on the size of the tumor location, is there a component going on the porous or in, along the notch going up, the extent of tumor, the pathology you are dealing with, experience of the surgeon and the preoperative condition of a patient. I like this uh, graphs because it shows the two common approaches. So, so of course, the frontoorbital zygomatic can give you access to posterior cavernous sinus and uh, you can reach even Meckel scale. But the Kawazi approach, which is the anterior petrosal and the retro sigmoid is the posterior approach, is the uh, power horse, uh, approach like the Terion approach for the frontal lateral area. And uh, Yezerji, a long time ago, he divided the petrosal tumors into three, anterior, middle, and posterior. You can see it on this picture here. And uh, we'd like to divide them by the level, of course, uh, le the level above the Michelscape, uh, and between the Michelscape and the uh, Antenna acoustic meatus, this is the segment one, and the level of the antenna 
acoustic meatus is two and below the jugular is three. And from these levels, you can decide what is the ideal approach for you to go. But now talking about endoscopy, I will give a few statements that using the endoscope as a hybrid with the microscope, it gives you the extended arm along the tentorium to go higher up without having the complex procedure we used to do in the 80s and early 90s, a lot of drilling and uh, time consuming. This is the Kawazi approach. Uh, this is our friend, Dr. Kawazi, looking to his approach. And of course, this has been described and I'm sure uh, Dr. Sanjeeva will go over this. These the two giants, uh, I said that I was privileged to spend some time with them. Professor Yezaji when he was in Zurich and Professor Majid Sami in Hanover. Both they have excelled with the posterior fossa approach and especially the retrosigmoid approach. And both they popularize the procedure that has been done earlier, the sitting position, because they have been trained on the sitting position. Dr. Kurt Sherman, who was the chair in Mainz, and he was doing uh, his cases in sitting position. So this is an evolution that the son take it from the father and the father, and the son give it to his grandees. And I think this is the authoritative approach. I, that's what I told you. You get trained by somebody who's doing mostly sitting position is very difficult to debate. I was privileged to learn the sitting position in Germany, and I continue to do that 15 years, but eventually I have some trouble when I moved to Saudi Arabia by our anesthetist. When I tell them sitting position, they have to take Prozac and they got so stressed because of the air embolism issues. And I came with this idea that uh, park bench procedure can mimic a sitting position, especially with the new development of new tables. You can flex and fracture these tables and you can elevate the trunk of that patient. You see, this patient is almost in the semi-sitting position, a slow position. So whenever I'm dealing with a, a lesion like this, I put her in that position. Well, at the end of the procedure, I flatten the bed, so not pneumocephaly, and I can handle the cerebellum very well by tilting the table forward. I did have arranged for a video, but I thought the time does not allow within 20 minutes to talk about all these things. But this is the position we would like to do. And this is the type of incision I will say. And of course now navigation system has facilitated a lot of uh, localization for us, starting by the incision. But for people in some places, they don't have the navigation this is still the gold standard. You follow from the protuberance occiput along the zygoma arc. This is the line that is where, in most of the cases, the lateral sinus is. And the astrion is the junction between the lateral sinus and the sigmoid. So when you do your bob hole, you just put it a little bit lower than the astrion, and you make the flap two or three bob holes it will be adequate to expose nicely the retrosig approach with the smaller flap that you need. And the mastoid tip is, of course, it highlights almost the base of the posterior fossa. Uh, that picture on the other side, this is not the type of incision I'll do. I took it from the web. This is the type of incision I'll do. And specifically, I put that picture up because of the uh, occipital minor nerve. If you see it on the way, don't try to have a cut it. Just dissect it and move it because some of the patients after the surgery, they complain of pain and headache from this one. So you try to mobilize it. Don't take the monopole and cut everything on the way. Try to be more anatomist. And the same with the occipital artery especially if you are dealing with the vascular uh, surgery and aneurysm of the ICA or PICA, and you have to close vessels and you do bypass, leave that vessels like what we do with the superficial temporal artery. Now, this is a small trick I learned from Professor Yazarji before you open the dura completely. And 
you see this, he makes a small incision at the base of this uh, opening. This is the cisterna, near the cisterna magna, and I'll just play it a little bit. This is a tense dura when you start. If you open the dura, where you, you have a big mass, that cerebellum might terminate against you. And then it will be strangulated, and it will be very difficult to handle. You have to resect it. So this is a small thing I'll do. I'll incise this cisterna magna. Use a scissor, and most recently, and now I just use a needle. I use a needle and let it drain. And usually I leave a small suction at the bottom here above the path. You see the pulsation of the dura. And then when you have a relaxed dura, you can cut the dura without having the cerebellum pressing against and making that mass effect because you relieve the CSF, like cisternos to me uh, with our colleague concept, uh, Professor Ivan. So then we applied the technique of everybody, central debulking of these tumors. And there are different variants made for this approach. Some people say, look to the facial nerve to start with at the flocculus. Some others say, drill first, so you can identify. In most of the cases I have, I don't have this very tiny small tumor that you follow this concept. Usually this tumor is giant, uh, big, that will cover the whole area. So the first things I will start, I identified the supermeatal area and the tent so I know where I am. And then I start with central debulking as you've seen on the video and then dissect the surrounding by maintaining the arachnoid. So the steps of this is written here. Proper position is very essential. Maintain the arachnoid layer, relieve the CSF, capsule dissection, and I'll use the stimulation probe. There have been a lot of talk that if you use the stimulation probe for dissection and do a lot of stimulation that the amplitude of the facial nerve will be declined. I never have, I have been doing this for almost 14 years with no problem. We low, low power dissection, especially when I am near the nerve. So I can do the dissection at the same monitoring. And that dissector is malleable as a fantastic, like, like a Rosen dissector. These are some of the cases I did before and after. And this is a giant one. I left something. There is nothing wrong by leaving a little bit of the vestibular sharma that size. We have alternative treatment to handle this one. Important, you have the compressed the optic chiasm. And in giant tumor, I will summarize later, the most important factor, remove the bulk and maintain the integrity of the cranial nerves. So don't give a young lady a facial pulses that she has to live with for all her life. And this is the outcome of the facial nerve in general in CP angle tumor surgery. I didn't bombard you with the statistic. I was having several slides from publication by Professor Majid Sami, by uh, Atul Gowel, by uh, Misra. There are many good paper on that. They are all coming to the same conclusion eventually when it comes to the sizable one. Of course, Professor Sammy's experience, nobody can match it of 5,000 or plus cases, but he was privileged to have a major referral and have these small cases as part, almost half of his practice were with a small tumor that you can save the facial for sure, and you can even save hearing in some of the cases. So size of the tumor, location, pathology, I'm talking about CP angle, experience of the surgeon and the extent of resection. And most important, the presence of intraoperative neurophysiologists to monitor the nerves. Some people in the past, they have short temper. They said this elongate the procedure, but on the cost of the quality of outcome. 
This is the summary of several papers about the smaller tumor, conservative treatment of small tumor. It become an acceptable in elderly, in patient with a high comorbidity, they cannot tolerate a long procedure, and patient who has serviceable hearing, even with no progression on imaging, in one, two years, they will lose the hearing. Even the cases of Sasami published that day, he saved the hearing in one, two years, they start declining. I think it's, it has something to do with degeneration or ischemic, chronic ischemic changes. So it's a clinical wisdom and the judgment call and depends on your experience in saving hearing. So the conclusion total or near total resection should be the goal in giant. Preservation of hearing is extremely difficult in my hand for a giant tumor. And even on small tumor, if you save it, the gut was on a follow up in two or three years. Integrity of the nerve, as I mentioned, of cranial nerves are, and the brainstem is your priority. For meningioma and the CP angle, uh, we apply the 5D, which is decompression, uh, dissection of the arachnoid, of course. And I sometimes drill the ridge of the petrous bone, like what we do drilling the sphenoid ridge. So the retromastoid approach, it gives you several avenues. But I, the avenue I like when I have a large tumor more medially located is the supramiatal approach. This approach was described a couple of years ago by my friend uh, Amirati and Majid Sami when he was with him. And they followed the supramiatal approach to access tumor from there and incise the tentorium medially so you have access to an extension going along the tentorial niche. And of course, it gives you the approach to go below the facial uh, vestibular nerve complex. This is a case, I'm going to show the video. This is a lady presented with a headache. She has this meningioma, very concerned of potential having any facial or trigeminal uh, problem. Uh, it reached the tentorium edge, as you see on this image. There is no major compression, but a meningioma and a patient have 50s. If I wait on that, there is a potential of progression. I will show the video. I'd like to here to give my thanks to my chief resident. He's now with me. He's uh, playing the video, Dr. Ahmed Al Ahmadi. He put some of the question to you or today on the web, and he answered a few of them. This is the meningioma we devascularized, and then we start peeling the arachnoid. That technique used by Majid Sami, even with the acoustic memory, I like to use it uh, by using two forceps to peel the arachnoid. This is important. This arachnoid in meningioma and other disease belong to the brain or to the brainstem. Don't use the bipolar immediately and weld the arachnoid on the meninges, on the capsule. Now you see, we put the endoscope, you have under the tent and you see the medial part to the tumor and we see the third nerve and we see the brainstem and the eye cap. Now back to microscope and I start feeling the arachnoid. Put the microscope, the endoscope again, I alternate between the them. And now I'm taking the tumor capsule and the attachment sharply because I have nothing to be worried about here. It's along the tentorium and posterior part of the, sphenic, the petros. Use the CUSA to do some debulking after I did the devascularization, so I'm not working on a field filled of blood. Now I'm 
Once I took a good part of it, I start lifting this. I leave some, so I have a hold because this will help me to dissect the arachnid. This tool I am using is a ball dissector. As a beautiful tool, I use it in aneurysm surgery and here to hold on this lesion. Because if you take the biopsy forceps, it will fragment this tumor for you. And you see now the arachnoid peeling. And you see how it comes over the brain stem. Now tumor after the, it can be removed easily. After it was disconnected from its attachment, can be taken in two pieces and maintain the arachnoid. You see the trigeminal nerve nicely below with cover the arachnoid down and the attachment is coagulated. And then now we will put the endoscope again to see if any residual. So this is the trigeminal, I'm seeing a little bit residual here. And this is the sixth nerve. Life, you see it going into the Dorello canal. And this is the third, this is the sixth again. This is the ICA. And this is the motor part of the trigeminal, and this is the sensory part. So this is after the move of the last piece. And you see, as we went infrasupra, but laterally, and this is the post-operative this section, see the cerebellum as it's not touched. Can I check back to the presentation. The pre-sigmoid approach, there are many advantages. Once you do this procedure, you have a major exposure from cranial nerve to down to 11, the Hakuba approach, the modified, but in day three procedure, you can spend time six hours doing the drilling and the two or three craniotomies, posterior fossa, pre-sigmoid, and the subtemporal area. But one thing I want to stress here, I leave the rest for Dr. <laughs> Sanjeeva. We'd like to do the mastoid flap when we do the pre-sigmoid approach by using the B1 from pediatric craniotomy without uh, shield and cut the mastoid in a triangular shape and then use the chisel, take the outer layer of that mastoid. So when you finish, you can always refix this one. It's a nice cosmetic and it helps supporting any graft you put for your uh, CSF control. This technique, I am not my own design. This is made by uh, Fukushima, he taught me this technique and I use it frequently when I do this approach. One thing about bone flap, you see the bob hole, when you take the muscle from the suboccipital area, of course, the teaching, we always say no pipe, no monopolar. For posterior fossa, I use liberal, the monopolar needle, because you see the emissary, this is the picture of the emissary down, they are flushed with the bone. If you take the monopolar and just cut them at the level of the bone and wax, rather than to use the raspa or the osteo, uh, yeah, raspatorium to pull on this emissary and they might lacerate deeper the sinus, especially over the sinus or over the mastoid emissary. So that area, I cut it flush at the bone level. The rest I use only the rasp. For the pre sigmoid approach, this is an important to select the approach. If you don't have a good Troutman triangle, this is the pre sigmoid area, 
adequate for drilling and expose, then you cannot do the procedure. So you have to make judgment and by looking for your images as well. This is from Dr. Mufti's pictures. And this case was done with the pre-sigmoid approach, pre and this is post-op resection. You see, as is not touched because it gives you a good exposure. And you see CSF and pre pontine sustain is back to normal. And this is another one. And we left something at the back of the dorsum cellulae and the cavernous sinus. So it's fine if you leave a little bit of this in a patient who is 60 or 60 plus, but important to understand the venous drainage in that approach. Venal blabe is very important and the venous system and Dr. Ohata who worked with Dr. Hakuba has published a nice paper of retrospect, uh, retrospective drainage system from the sphenoparietal rather than from the petrosa. So you have to be careful when you are planning to ligate the superior petrosal sinus for the pre uh, sigma approach. This case, it has a component supracellar along the notch. I was planning to do pre sigmoid We were a fan of pre sigmoid But when I looked to the sinus, lateral sinus and sigmoid, see, it's very prominent. And this area, there is no space. So I thought, let me try taking it from below, cutting the tentorium and use the endoscope. And that's what we did. And you see, this is post resection, a beautiful picture after the resection. The last tumors I will talk about is the epidermoid. Epidermoid can reach a big size, is a creeping tumor. I always say it goes from one cistern to the other, does not respect vessels, it goes around the vessels, around the nerves, but its removal. Once you do it, you like it. I call it the chopsticks technique because I use just the dissector and the suction and it will be mobilized most of them. And I want to show another video we did. We're using the endoscope Let me show this video. See, we are doing a CP angle from the left side, small opening. Just move it forward. Again, this famous ball dissector, I'm using it. Important in this procedure to pay attention to, to the perforator. You see a lot of perforators here. There are a few there. They are not a tumor vessels. If you go more precisely, slowly you will see these are fibers of the nerves. And you see how they can, but they are easy to dissect in most of the cases. Sometimes it's very adherent to the brainstem and then I leave. If it doesn't come easy, I will leave it. This epidemoid person can live 10 years to get their recurrence if they got it. Of course, the problem in CP angle, these are wet or mustard, you have to work between the nerves. But if you have the command of microsurgery, you will be able to do this. You see the small vessels. Now I put the endoscope. 
And I thought I removed a good portion of this tumor, but you see, there are still tumor next to the brainstem. This is brainstem, and I'm using now the CUSA under vision of the endoscope. And you see the view after a good resection. We still have residual tumor. We are handling slowly, but we are inspecting. The, the view you get by the endoscope, you cannot get the same by the microscope. It gives you a near vision and a panoramic view. And you can follow any residual lesion that is hiding in the blind corner for the microscope. See, now this is the stimulator I told you about. See, now I'm not stimulating, but I'm using it. But I have fibers on it. I don't know, it looks like a nerve or fibers of a nerve. So Imad, we have one more minute. I am almost done. So this is from my view from the endoscope for earlier. I know there is a fragment there. So I go with this probe and I try to trace it back. Here it is. Okay, we'll go to the next. So for the epidermoid, as I said, chopsticks, I use endoscope and this is the home message. Don't be part of a master of disaster and accept simplicity and appreciate sometimes imperfection. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Imad. Uh, we have some questions, but uh, uh, there are two interesting ones. And uh, uh, Tsotne is asking you about the role of intraoperative neurophysiology. How do you manage that? What do you think about it? How, how do you perform it? Yeah, I think we mentioned it. Now, all these cases, we have a neurophysiologist and the technician. The, the technician learn how to do this part and they call the physician because in the early practice, we ask the physician, the neurologist to be all the time and the, this is something they want to accept. But eventually after teaching the technician, we'll do, we'll take the cranial nerves, they are, in, they are involved the fifth and seventh and the 11th. And we do the brainstem motor evoke potential. In the old days, 20 years ago, we don't have the motor evoke potential. We used to do the somatosensory. This will not reflect about the motor dysfunction after the surgery sometimes. The other advantage of the neurophysiology, even your position of the patient to start with, if you have flexed the neck too much in an elderly, they will tell you there is signal changes. If you have a pressure on the plexus while you are putting the hand uh, hanging and there is no support or padding, they will tell you. If the elbow under pressure, they will tell you. So it has a lot of value and if you want to make your outcome, good outcome, you should not do this procedure without the neurophysiologist. Thank you so much, Matt. So I think we are on time. Can I have a little remark? Please. Uh, yes. uh, Imad, you have perfectly shown in one of your videos the meningioma. 
The meningioma surface is uh, not smooth, but rough. If you have a smooth surface of the meningioma, it means you are in a uh, wrong uh, space, that the meningioma is still covered by the arachnoid. Do you agree? I think that, no, I don't. I think you've seen the arachnoid dissected. Right, right. But if you have smooth the surface of the meningioma during resection, of course, yeah, at least they, they have, point. yeah. You must be looking at the surface yeah. of the tumor. Yeah, I get your point. Arachnoid, yeah. it give a smooth surface and shiny surface on the meningioma. Exactly. And that's why all meningioma, you start by trying to open that layer and identify it and dissect it from the surface of the, from the meningioma proper, from the caps. Exactly. Yeah. So uh, we were watching the room, Imad. We were not sure if there was someone with you because we saw four hands and only one person. Yeah, uh, I told, I mentioned uh, Dr. <laughs> Ahmed, he is the chief resident. He was the one who put the video.